Welcome back, everyone. The Stories of the Week is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business-critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen-testing machine. Check out our mailing list on Monday, Cyber Monday, for a special deal in your chance to win a Pwn Plug R3. For all of those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at BlackHillsInfoSec.com to request your quote today. And we're back with the stories. Now, Jack, you said you didn't have a lot of stories. I found a lot of stories this week. Because I don't, I, my new zero, RSS reader. Zero is not a lot. Zero is not a lot, yes. Um, I, I, I think Paul is the winner for stories this week because <laughs> I got zero too. I, I wanted <laughs> to start with my story number 15. This is reverse engineering Dell's DRAC firmware. This was an artic article by Ruben Santamarta who did a bunch of research in reverse engineering the DRAC firmware. Um, it turns out this firmware doesn't use Etsy Shadow. And he had found this backdoor account. It was like user one was the account. Turns out that account was never used. And some may be befuddled by this. But it means that, OK, the backdoor wasn't accessible. But when you're reverse engineering firmware, this happens quite a bit. You will find artifacts that are sometimes not used in the production environment. Or maybe it was carryover from a test environment they were doing, or really carryover from another hardware revision. Sometimes the firmware is copied from a different hardware device, and then features aren't implemented. So in reverse engineering, you're like, holy crap, I found the world's most gigantic back door. But it, it, really, it, it really isn't. So uh, props to Ruben for updating his website <coughs> with the, uh, the most recent information, which I think is really cool. Uh, so, so Paul, um, am I interpreting that correctly in that the uh, encrypted uh, representations of the password were actually contained within Etsy password and readable? by anybody. Yes, that is correct. I, I just wanted to, not that I didn't know that, but I just wanted to point that out for the listeners. So. There are a lot of, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, there are a percentage of embedded systems that haven't gotten updated since the early 90s or so when we used to put the password hash in Etsy password and not store it in Etsy shadow. Uh, that's one thing that you find in these lovely embedded systems, which is just awesome. Oh, it's fabulous because we all know that we have like super fast GPUs that can crack this stuff in seconds and we also have cloud cracking services that can do it in milliseconds. So it's fabulous. Important to note that he did not find this on a production running system. He found this in the firmware, which means that any device running this firmware contains that exact same username and password combination. Same salt as well, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, actually, if it's in Etsy Password, it probably isn't even salted. I think it was before uh, salting. Pre oh, it predates salting. Wow, nice. Uh, re he also did some reverse engineering on some industrial firmware, and he posted some updates. This was research he did in December of 2011. And I'm curious, um, did people update their firmware from 2011? Industrial control systems? Uh, not firmware? likely. Paul Coggin, you want to weigh in on that? How often do you think people update their firmware and industrial control systems? When they need a, when they have a new feature that they have to turn on. But my experience is very rare that those systems get uh, touched. They get deployed. They're you know they're so specialized mm -hmm. and uh, special purpose. If there's not a bug that's triggered, if it, if, it, if there's not a problem, some kind of hard requirement, some anomaly new feature that's required, those things do not get touched. And when they get changed, depending on the environment, it's, it's very, very rare. I mean, it's going to be scheduled, you know, a couple times a year. Things may happen depending on what kind of environment it is. Uh, but most of it, you put it in place and you forget it's there. Well, and uh, it's interesting, the same way in that people update their phones. <clears throat> the reason right. that people update firmware on their phones is because they want the latest features. Uh, now, well, though, it, uh, firmware updates on your phones are more in your face. Jack, did you get the update on all your Samsung devices recently? Oh, both my Samsung devices that run Android push out this massive update. They were like, you must, actually all three of mine gave me an update over the weekend. Uh, no. 
it, they almost like make it difficult to get out of the update. Yeah, yeah I, I know. Would you like to update and there's only the yes button? I'm like, I, but the, I'm, a, I'm about to get There's in the always car. the off button, Paul. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. They like trick you, you know? And then, you know, my son has it. And it, well, one of them, my tablet's my son. So he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's just like clicking random stuff. And But, but like, is, okay. that, is that coming from Samsung? That's not coming from Samsung. That's coming from the carrier, right? That would be coming from the carrier. So this update was pushed on my AT&T because all... Well, no, it came on my Wi-Fi only tablet as well. Inter interesting. interesting, very interesting. It was almost like a Samsung triggered the update, but I'm sure in the AT&T devices, because two of mine are AT&T devices, one is not. And this problem won't go away because they're um, I'm getting. I mean, iPhone, that's part of the that's part of the Android challenge. Is you, you never know, and just because you're on the same version number, if you're on two different carriers, you don't know that that means you're actually running the same software and. And stuff. Right. Um, all your base. So the EFF has this initiative where they want to encrypt the entire internet. Should you read about yeah, this? The EFF and a whole bunch of other people. Yeah, yeah like Mozilla. Uh, uh, Akamai and uh, Mozilla yeah, exactly. and um, yeah. a bunch of other big rollers. Nice thing about EFF, they seem to have brought in what I believe to be some of the major players to make this happen. And right. you may say, well, why are they calling the encrypt the internet? They basically want to force HTTPS on everything. Well, they're, and they're doing it the right way because they are making it free and yes. easy. Oh. Holy shit. Can you imagine that? We want people to do stuff, so we are going to make it free and easy. This is just like, what an amazing concept. Are you listening, PGP? Uh, <laughs> The biggest <laughs> obstacle to HTTPS <laughs> deployment has been complexity, bureaucracy, and the cost, cost of certificates <laughs> just that <laughs> HTTPS requires, Jack. That's to quote the article directly. I was like, wow, holy crap. They summarized the problem in one freaking sentence. And I, I think most larger organizations may tackle this problem better than others. I don't want to say they all do it well, but larger deployments are better suited because they have people and processes and they're at least set up I think better to implement TLS across all of their now whether they do it or not are two different things but they're set up for it you, you get down into the smaller people and you, it goes back to that sentence dude it's it's a pain in the ass is really what they're saying <laughs> right so, uh, it, okay it, it okay needs, so, it so what is the EFF easy. actually doing though paul are they starting a massive ca yes. that is free yes. effectively yeah yes effectively yes that's that's it and it's a ca that of course now you're gonna have to trust and people have mm -hmm. raised trust issues about cas right um a as they rightfully should but um uh, not to put too fine a point on it would do you have any more or less trust for well-intentioned free CA uh, than you do for somebody that you hate because they charge you $3,000 for an EV cert or whatever the heck it is. And who's going to do more validation? I mean, cause, uh, apparently they're actually going to do some checking. They're going to, you know, if you want to get this cert, you're going to have to, like, change your record, insert something somewhere so that they can see you're actually in control of the domain. Which uh, are, are not they inserting where? Yeah, they're inserting it. Um, right. That's some authentication. But, you know, something's got to change on your domain. You know, some something has to appear that shows that you're in control of that domain. Now that well, well, I mean, come on now. I mean, it goes down to how deep does the rabbit hole get? I mean, let's face it. We all trust dynamic shared objects on every operating system we use. Uh, should we? <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> Oh, I guess we went into a deep dark place yep. right then. Yeah. Sorry we, about that. We did. It's just I'm um, I'm gonna I'm gonna. You want to talk and, about? And, and I'm being platform agnostic when I say that most operating systems today. Uh, you know, that's that's what was wrong with Multix was the mult part. You know, we uh, we had already gone off the rails by the mult the multi part of Multix. I just. I, Get off my oh, lawn. Oh, Jack, it's time for a complete rant, please. <laughs> no, no, no.
No, we're no, not no. quite there yet. No, <laughs> we're, not, we're not going there. Not Once yet. he finishes his second cocktail. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm shiny and Oh, you're shiny happy. and happy today. I'm shiny and <coughs> happy today. I, uh, it's, uh, no. Where, what did you do with Jack? <laughs> you're an imposter. I, I just, it's uh, your very zen shirt. It's, it's it, my very zen. zen. It's not black. Now, of course, we're, as I kind of move, it's, it's, people are going to have seizures because let's get the, the ripple of ripples yeah. of fat going here. But exactly. maybe it's not not black enough. So it's, so it's, uh, you it's need not rippling layered, in the camera for me. Layered network protection is where you need to be, Jack. Layered network. Basically, this article boils down to you need antivirus patch and web protections. Oh, is that all? That's, you know. That's all? That's all. That's what you need. We can we all go home. Our job virus. here is done. I implement some AV, apply a few patches, some web protections, and we're good. Right? Do we need to give this guy All right. So fun? here we go. Look, I'm going to. I, I this was a. I, all right. That's a good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, I've said it many times. I'm sure everybody's sick of hearing it, but I, I'm not as elegant or eloquent as SPAF, but channeling my inner SPAF, additive security is not security. It is a bandage that we're relying on. It's a crutch that we rely on, but adding complexity to a system to reduce complexity yeah. doesn't actually work. It's the, it may be the best bandage we have. Right. We can't be pedantic and say everybody needs to, you know, fire up that internet VM of Multics and master that, and then we can harden that puppy. No, no, but we need to accept that applying patches is, they're called patches for a reason. Uh, adding antivirus to the top of the number of vulnerabilities that antivirus introduces is, is not, not saying I don't want to do it. This actually blew up on Twitter this week. People talking about, you know, the antivirus is dead. And I, uh, Jeremiah Grossman said it and others have said it for years. I've said it for years. The problem with the antivirus is not that it's dead or worthless. The problem is we pay way too much for it in many cases. Do you want well, to have 10,000 users on the Windows machines, although, you know, any desktop OS with no antivirus protection at all? No but, endpoint. But, excuse me. It's not antivirus. It's, it's uh, anti-malware. No, wait. It's, it's not. Protection. It's endpoint protection now, right? Because we got past anti-malware because nobody knew what malware was. So, <laughs> um, and besides endpoint protection... Uh, in, Isn't that applying patches to your endpoints? Oh, well, that's that <laughs> is adding. That's usually means adding extra code to your machine so you can add extra complexity to make sure it's secure. But anyway, we pay too much, I think, for the value. Is it Emmet free? Is that still adding software to protect what you have? Emmet is, is that adding control? Emmet is uh, is adding adding software. Now the, the really software. cool thing about it gives you it, control. It does give it does give you control, and the cool thing about Emmet, I think, is longer term more than short term. Now for this laptop running Emmet 5.1, mm -hmm. there are certain protections that it's got because I run Emmet. Right. More significantly, I think, in the in the global scheme of things, is that lessons learned from Emmet end up in. Which is why endpoint protection products. No, they end up in oh in the OS in the itself. OS yeah. right. So Windows eight one, uh, love it or hate it, and I know most people are in the the latter category. Hated it. Um, well, so Windows eight was horrible, mm. and Windows eight one is less horrible, and love so therefore happens. you can live with it. Windows ten looks even more promising to me, but some of the lessons learned for the you know the usability and performance and backwards compatibility trade offs learned in Emmet become part of the OS. And I think that's a, a key thing. So if you're really moving forward, if you're using these things, as you said, to, to provide control as well as protection, and it teaches you a lesson that you can move forward with, not to sound like a Microsoft cheerleader, I don't look good in short skirts and pom-poms anymore. Um, disagree. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a difference. But it is still <laughs> adding code. <laughs> Adding complexity and wait, 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 wait! You you haven't said the thing that I'm desperate to say, Jack, and that is, Grr. whatever happened to good solid architecture and the word is minimizing the attack surface before we start adding layered protections on top. Jack, you, I mean, Joff, you just played right into my hand, dude. This is my whole marketing slogan 
for Nessus was reduce your attack surface. Minimize the attack surface. I mean, that's absolutely necessary, and everybody's forgetting it. It drives me crazy. Well, but see, I think that is what antivirus and patching are really kind of intertwined and trying to accomplish, right? The, the problem the is that antivirus or endpoint, the, ulti the problem with antivirus is that it does not reduce the attack surface. It right. enlarges it. Right. Yep. Yes. But when I say endpoint protection, I mean making sure that you configure your endpoints securely and making sure that your software is up to date. Uh, is, doesn't that all go towards protecting yes, endpoint right. protection? Yes, and it depends right? on whether we want to get cranky old man pedantic about multi-purpose operating systems, multi-user environments, blah, 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 versus everybody's going to run a version of QNX on their laptop. Or this is CPM. the mess we have, yeah, and this is what we can do to reduce the messiness of the mess. The real challenge and the frustration for people who've been doing this longer than I have, the conversation I have with, with uh, the other elders is that they've been listening to the here's the best we can do short term and we're going to fix it long term for 50 years mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i completely get the frustration and i share it but if we want to be more secure after our turkey coma this week we're going to look at antivirus anti-malware like things we're going to look at patching we're going to look at um hardening <coughs> things uh we're going to look at you know hardening remember that the good old-fashioned hardening we're going to look at things and you know part of the problem with patching that i have is we say patching and i try to say mitigation rather than patching but just to remind people that hey instead of patching java if you don't need it Remove it. Well, Remove that's it. The job yes. Point of reducing your attack surface. Right. Well, so, well, but if you need it, properly deploy the latest version. If you don't need it, remove it. Or maybe you can't do anything to it because you don't own the machine. It's the machine that goes bing in the hospital, and you only lease it, and they don't support anything. And so that's when you put some tiny little device which is a, a simple firewall in front of it and you can't interfere or nat that traffic at all but you can say well look this should only do these protocols on these ports granted it's exactly. still clear text I, look it's telnet i give up there's nothing i can do about this but there's no reason that the open file shares should be open to the rest of the hospital environment or the whatever environment what do we need to make it work here we go. We're going to put this device in transparently in, in the pipe, and we're going to uh, limit that. And while we have that little box there transparently in front, we're going to, ready, everybody? We're going to monitor and log from that monitor point so that if its behavior changes, we know what's happened. I, I was going to make a I'm point, sorry, Jack. I'm getting off my unicorn now. I, I was going to make one more point, and that is sometimes patching reverses the min minimization process of your of your attack surface so sometimes patching will increase your exposure inadvertently so oh it's important for people to realize yes. that post post patching they need to come back in and compare <coughs> with their baseline and harden that's, their systems again absolutely and it, that that third party software thing so yep microsoft does tends not to turn things back on with a patch anymore they've certainly They've learned. <laughs> They've learned uh, that, you know, they're far from perfect. They did the last sets of bugs, MS, MS 14066, uh, was not without teething pains. Uh, but when you update some application, uh, it may just do a fresh install of Java 1.4 in a non standard uh, location, right? <sighs> uh, I have a great example of that, and it's in my XSS story. Great article on cross-site scripting. Johannes is quoted as stating that, I thought this was interesting, XML RPC requests are being used to bypass same origin policy, which is interesting, because that stuff can happen outside of the browser, I'm assuming, or I'm not sure how, I, that's one I have to research. Uh, I thought that was a great point. Um, 
But people tend to give a much lower priority to XSS because the attack success depends largely on the context of the vulnerability. Like cross-site scripting is not always just cross-site scripting. We tend to lump it all into the same category and threat level of cross-site scripting. Sometimes it's not likely to be exploited. Other times if you dig a little deeper, cross-site scripting leads to root access. So the trick is figuring out the difference. From a defense standpoint, we can sit here and say, like we have been, apply your patches. Likely the patch for a cross-site scripting vulnerability is probably not going to blow up your site. It could, not saying that it couldn't, but in all the years of maintaining sites, typically that fix for cross-site scripting has gone over pretty well. However, majority of the time, some of the time, when you install the, to get that fix for cross-site scripting means upgrading to the next version of said software. Now, coupled in that release of software is bug fixes, security fixes, and features. Features and changes, changes, removals, additions, whatever the case may be. That's the stuff that usually breaks stuff on your website, in, in my opinion, speaking strictly of web software. So unfortunately, this means upgrading the entire application, which could then lead to more vulnerabilities. So maybe just get good at upgrading. I don't know what my advice is. To upgrade and test and upgrade and test. Upgrade and, and, test, upgrade and, test. and get good at upgrading. Right, and and then here goes another, oh man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got him going. <laughs> so, I'm going to say two words, and people will groan. Mm. It's because it's often done wrong, and the two words are change control. Uh, and I would, uh, <laughs> I would like to point out that the words are change control. It is not change prevention. prevention. Oh, it is really. not change obfuscation. Sometimes it's change approval. It like Im immediate pr approval. <laughs> properly done change control means that the oh shit moment has a path to back out of it. Um, it means that somebody else looked at it and said, maybe, maybe you shouldn't do that with TCP syslog. Um, <laughs> you know, somebody else looked at it, an extra set of eyes, and maybe it's maybe it's crisis, and you push it in, and you have the authority to roll it out, but you've done some documentation. And the documentation may be, I applied this patch and then this service pack with a reboot in between so that when it goes sideways, you can actually remember because it was 2 in the morning and you were cursing because they won't hire anybody to help you. So change control, um, documenting what you've done, having some sort of approval process, even if it's yourself, put it down. I'm adding this. I'm upgrading these boxes to Office 2013, um, whatever, so that you know what you're doing. You, you kind of have a plan, forces you to put a little thought into how you're going to do your changes and a little thought into unwinding them. Wait, isn't that an oxymoron? I mean, don't you have to know what you're doing to know what you're doing? I'm, I'm confused. Yes. <clears throat> I don't know what I'm doing. I, 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 Okay, well, I just, you know, wanted to throw that out there. But, Jack, you raise a good point. It's a good discipline for people if they work in a environment that does not exercise tight change controls to implement a process for themselves because maybe in talking to your peers – you can actually influence your organization to begin adopting your process. Um, so, yeah, it's um, you got to know what you're doing in terms of what you're about to impact and, and whether you have a plan to back it out effectively. That's a very, very critical point. Also, if you've got some form of even fairly basic, but at least you make an entry in Excel or Notepad every time you make a change, um, when something isn't right and doesn't match what it used to be, you can figure out who made the change. And if it's not in the change management system and you have it, and everybody at least says, change some firewall rules today, even if they don't document it properly, when you find stuff that isn't right, either know who to ask about it and why they did it's it. It's always the firewall. What do you or about? it is always the firewall. <laughs> to this day, it's always the firewall. Um, even with the any, any, any allow rule. But um, still the firewall. it's still the firewall. We never see those. <laughs> oh, God. 
um, you get to you start to wonder. Oh, uh, was was it one of the uh, volunteer admins um, from China or Belarus that made these adjustments? Mm. You know. <laughs> It's the, you know, it, it's it, one of the things I used to do uh, in, in, in prior life was actually keep just a simple text file um, on a file system that everybody – it was some sort of bastion host that everybody had access to. And I would tell the team – I was running the team at that point. I would tell them, hey, guys, if you make a change, all I ask is that you put a one sentence in there with a date and who did it, and that's it. Write it down. Uh, you know, a simple but effective mechanism. Um you know, let's not get carried away. Let's not build a database. Let's not go architecting giant systems to track everything we're doing. Just put an entry in a file. You know, just as simple as that. So we so we have an idea of what happened and when it happened. Um, and and you know, okay, that even that simple mechanism can can make a, a tremendous difference. Absolutely. And even if you're a, a one person shop or you know small shop, um, I used to use a. Uh, I used to use two things. One, a replicated and shared uh, Excel spreadsheet because sooner or later everything goes to Excel. And a, a, a lightweight wiki, support project wiki. And I was the only IT guy. Uh, of course, there were, you know, 200 or so employees on, depending on how you broke out the corporations, five or six corporations and depending on what time of whatever, five, six buildings across four or five towns. And so I would like rush off and solve a problem uh, or try to solve it and, and lose things. And even solo, just the, I'm going to catch up for a minute here. I'm going to make some notes on what I did. Um, it was great. Uh, why did I do this? Why am I fighting this at 2.30 in the morning? Oh, right. I had to do this because of that thing. Um, yeah. Oh, I wanted to talk about uh, remote code execution in HickVision surveillance DVR. HickVision, you Hick, say? HickVision. Is I'm this <laughs> like... <laughs> hey, Paul Coggin, is this like a YouTube channel in your neck of the woods? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you went there. Oh, man. I wasn't says, going with that, Paul. Says the guy from Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I've spent a lot That's of time fun. in the South, I, it's, yeah. and yet I'm still no, labeled a Yankee, yeah. even though. Yeah, yeah, I saw that article. I haven't read into it very much yet, but I, it is interesting. So, uh, but I've in, never... a, yeah, in addition to the RTSP buffer overflows, I, I put in my notes, oh, then there's this, and I quote, the devices also ship with a default username of admin and a default password of one, two, three, four, five. That's the same as my luggage. Because no one would guess that or maybe even think to look in the uh, documentation where I'm sure that's also documented. Or reverse engineer the firmware and probably find that pretty easily. Yeah, oh, my notes awesome. were, I need a drink, we're all doomed. It's a hacker's playground. Stock up on booze. Yeah. That's all I had I, on that. And RTSP had buffer overflows? Oh, I'd like to spend an evening with that. Uh, that's kind of cool. So what I found, Joff, is that many of the protocols in use by embedded system, particularly the ones that are used in any form of media streaming or sharing, or uh, shit. like DLNA, <laughs> uh, UPnP to a certain extent. I mean, there's a whole, it's on a slide in one of my presentations. I list out like half a dozen protocols that I've all seen in my research about reading about people that have found problems, buffer overflows, there's no authentication. Uh, it's just very popular, uh, usually on embedded systems. But there's all you know. There's implementations of these protocols not just, and everything. If you yeah. if you plug it back to Paul's, but if you sniff a, a central link inside almost any active network, you will see things. If you if you're Broadcast watching traffic from these you will protocols. see yeah. stuff, and you will think, "What the hell is this?" Mm -hmm. And it will be. Some streaming protocol, or on it will be some TV, brilliant TV. idea Microsoft has for like sharing crap, or Apple has. You, oh, you, 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 oh, look! It's uh, Bonjour wasn't dumb enough. We're going to come up with something worse than MDNS, right? And it's, and yes. the networks are overrun with this crap. And I would imagine that the vast majority of them would fall over if you looked at them really hard. Well, or, not only that, they're very chatty. 
uh, protocols, and typically sending out broadcast <coughs> traffic, you can almost <laughs> use them to identify, you know, you don't even need to try, you just fire up a sniffer, you don't have to be in a spam port, you fire up a sniffer and you're like, wow, look at all these fresh, shiny targets. That's awesome. It, it is so amazing, even a, you know, in a modern switched environment where we're not using hubs, mm -hmm. <laughs> once you go to broadcast, like yeah. you said, the, the stuff is just screaming. I have, uh, you know, even in my home labs, I've got a couple of places where traffic has choke points, mm -hmm. and there are a whole bunch of protocols that are dropped at a couple of different choke points. So mm -hmm. I, I really don't, in case I forget to kill MDNS after the next time I have to install iTunes on something because the iPad can't take an over-the-air update because Apple hates me. Um, <laughs> they hate you, too. They just cover it better. They just hate me. <laughs> um, <laughs> one and of the worst, and the DTLS, one of the and just go down the list of these protocols. It's like, ah, oh, we're just going to kill this here. At least it'll only scream in, uh, upstairs, or it'll only scream within this virtual server. Um yeah, uh, it, it is just it's fingerprint and um, I don't, I don't know. I give up. So, 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 so just to <laughs> just to pile on just a little bit, one of the worst things that uh, a junior network admin learns early on, especially if they're in large enterprise environments, is these chatty protocols sometimes are multicasting, not broadcasting, but multicasting <laughs> with with t with TTLs of one. Well, what a lot of junior network admins learn really quickly is a packet with TTL1 is often sent directly to the control plane of the device and processed in software on the upstream network device. So it essentially DOSes the, uh, usually the upstream routing device uh, because, because it's not, any, any packet with TTL1 is, is not pushed through the ASICs uh, and not, you know, short, short path switched, so to speak. Um, I'm sure Paul's seen a lot of that. And, uh, you know, these, these chatty multicast protocols can be a real pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I mean, I, uh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. I, I, I just, uh, what I typically see is all the uh, layer two, layer three protocols out there being multicast when I plug in. The low hanging fruit is just amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah, the, yeah redundant, the, the redundancy protocols, it's all out there on the wire. As someone who spent a, a lot of time in small business, uh, the amount of the amount of noise Spanning Tree makes in small business for no valid reason is terrifying. And the flip side of that is, when your small business becomes not so small anymore, you regret having turned Spanning Tree off everywhere. <laughs> so I've heard. Uh, <laughs> That's <awesome. clears throat> Tell me that wasn't a knowing laugh there. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I, I have. Um, I don't know anybody that's been in the network industry in their past and has not suffered um, either the overabundance of spanning tree or the lack thereof. <laughs> yeah. yeah, spanning tree is very hard to troubleshoot if you if you do that to yourself. Mm -hmm. if you, it's very hard to troubleshoot. But but I find that the spanning tree I love to see it because you know it's it's low hanging fruit for uh, messing with your senior or scappy or some other packet crafting tool. You yeah, really I was thinking somebody. about thinking about the other day. We 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 had an environment where nobody had tweaked um, the spanning tree priorities, and of course, those of us who know in the network business, if you send out BPDUs with a uh, with a lower priority, they're all two bit boundary. Uh, uh, Binary based, right? They, you know, zero, right. four, ninety six, eight, one, ninety two, et cetera. If you send out a packet and, and you were to loop two links with a, with a priority zero, and you've got an environment with default, which is normally uh, three, two, seven, six, eight, I think, um, right. you effectively can create a traffic path right through your device. Now you have to have, um, you know, a, a laptop or something that's capable of handling that traffic and bridging um, traffic across two interfaces, but. You know, so it's a non 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 um, script kitty kind of attack. It's quite a sophisticated trick, but you can right. certainly make traffic flow through you, and you don't have to have any games with the op table. I mean, you're getting everything if you become the preferred path from a spanning tree perspective. Now, however, That's great. and I don't know if this was my inability to detect the attacks, but if you don't have spanning tree enabled, I've seen people take out way more networks 
with creating. Oh yeah, you you will I eat have. the network fast. You will yeah. eat your laptop, and you will in this attack scenario, and you will eat the upstream switches. Oh well, I'm talking about like if you were to create just a loop. I've seen people like physically do 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 plug cables in. Oops, there's a loop because I didn't have spanning tree enabled. <laughs> Network yeah, network. so I will admit right now that I did that to myself in the house the other day, and I'm like, <laughs> I can't believe I did that. I, le I had a leftover link there, and I forgot about it, and my ESX server was eating itself alive. I'm like, what is going on? And then I saw the blinky lights on the switch. I'm like, ooh, oh, I know what I did. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. It, with the, the, those problems uh, with with the enterprises that have the Cisco switches anyway, these problems are real easy to solve. But nobody they pay the they pay the extra money for the blinky lights, but they don't turn on the features that yeah. that they yeah, paid BPDU, for. That's what drives all me. You, all you have to do there. is enable BPDU guard and yeah. uh, uh, you right. know the 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 root protections, and boom, it's done. You know mm -hmm. that's right. And, and, and it also goes goes back to uh, Jack's earlier point from the previous conversation about say the medical device. That's got certain features. Being able to lock it down instead of buying a firewall, they have they have the knobs to turn to lock these endpoint devices if they can't be patched. Lock down that trust relationship at layer two with like you know private VLANs and VLAN ACLs to lock it down. But we just buy the stuff. We don't turn the features on that we bought. Just you know, it's all yeah, about I've, just turning I've, on I've been lights. meaning I've been meaning to implement a small toolkit to do that spanning tree attack at some point because I'd like to play with that. Um, yeah. That one's a useful one um, for a yes, quick way to play man in the middle. And if you can play man in the middle, that you don't even have to poison op tables. Nothing. You don't have to crank out your attic cap. You just have to be hand. You have to have to be big enough to handle the great flow of traffic that's going to come through you. Mm -hmm. but, but the low hanging fruit now is just ridiculous out there. It used to be the ARP. It used to be the spanning tree. But now the IPv6 is that is some really nice low hanging fruit. Uh, it's multi being multicast out on the wire. It's amazing the new surface of attack that we've created uh, by leaving V6 enabled by default and not setting it up. It's uh, it's amazing the networks I'm plugging into. You don't have to do anything. Just pull up Wireshark and it's there. That's the only recon needed. And you can go pop the network. You know something like Evil Foca or Roll Your Own tool. It's amazing. If uh, if you're running WordPress. Uh, I would say just stop, cry, break down and cry, start drinking heavily. It's, it's ugly. It's ugly out there. But don't think that if you're running Joomla or Drupal that you're any better off. Because the research paper that was really, and now WordPress is completely screwed. We're completely screwed. Um, but there are some other um, vulnerabilities and some plugins that uh, all have similar, it was like a crypto PHP thing. There's a white paper I linked to in the show notes, which affects the other CMSs as well. So, wow. I don't have any happy news for you there. Wow, these content management systems have just been hammered one after the oh, other. It's ugly, dude. <laughs> just this week, even. It's just, it's ugly. It's ugly. Mm, I feel for people because you know um, they're they're feature rich. Um, I guess that's kind of the lesson in security. Often, yep. feature rich often means big attack surface. <laughs> I mean, you're just speaking from someone that knows someone that runs WordPress. Uh, you're constantly upgrading. You're constantly upgrading plugins, and you're constantly being creative as to ways in which to implement security <laughs> on those systems, uh, and alerting and monitoring. Uh, and that kind of thing. So, wow, nothing like keeping it real, Paul. Yes, you know, well, it's fun. You gotta, you know, you gotta stay sharp. Keeps me on my toes, or my friend on my toes, on his toes. What? <laughs> we got interns for that, don't we? <laughs> we have help, and, and well, that was kind of one of my comments about that job. And you bring up a great point. If you're going to run and maintain the CMS, have lots of people. To help yeah, have them looking people. at it constantly. Yes, looking at it constantly, <laughs> absolutely. Looking at packet captures. I mean, I was doing some packet it's captures. It's a great learning experience. <laughs> it is. I mean, I was looking at some packet captures today, and I'm like, is that a, is that a poison plugin? Is that a bad plugin? We need to investigate that, basically based on what packet capture I was doing for something completely different. But it's always in the back of my mind that like something's going wonky with WordPress. So, yeah. Yes. 
I uh, does anyone have any other story? I have I, the only story. I so have you have you have something I'm gonna ask. So if you're listening to this before the end of the month of November and you for some odd reason send ISC squared eighty five dollars a year. Um the elections are open for the board of directors. We tried to have the people who were running on the show. I, we, we I, so, I, 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 I should have. I should have thought about that earlier to make scheduling happen. Yeah, um, and it's fine. They're welcome on the show. Well, I guess we have to give them all equal airtime to be politically correct. No, we don't. Well, we don't have to, but that no, was the no. rule Fuck. that I set forth. But. Fuck that. <laughs> we, we, get, we get we get we get we get Wim on. You mean it? We get Wim Wim on, and we get Dave Lewis on, and. Once we get Allie Miller on, we get Allie on the show. Once we get Allie on the board, we get her. And <laughs> ah! Damn. Was that a chair fail? <laughs> yes, that was a chair fail. And we get JJ on the board. Uh, JJ's the on the board. And so we, we get them on. And the assholes we're trying to get rid of, we don't get on. and then it just <laughs> So go vote. Really, uh, go v- if you've got, look, I mean, it's just, it's, there's, there's some young idealistic people. I've almost given up on ISC squared, but not on the people that are trying to Maybe make it you better. Run, Jeff. Um, I tend to get a write-in vote or f- a handful of write-in votes every time, and I don't want it. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't want it. I don't want it. Don't want it. But go vote. There are folks that are trying to make a difference. Uh, if you like it the way it is, you can vote for the people that are continuing to fuck it up. If you uh, don't like it the way it is, you can vote for the people trying to make a change. Uh, just go vote. It's 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 not going to die. CISSP is too entrenched in stuff, mm. especially U.S. government. Uh, so maybe we can make it uh, better, and there are people really busting their butts to make it better. So uh, go and vote, um, and uh, vote early, vote often. No, wait, this is ISC squared, not Chicago. <laughs> oh, wow. 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 And with that, we're going to <laughs> take a short break, come back, and wrap up the show. And we're back just to say goodbye. Don't forget, shop.securityweekly.com. Sign up for the Security Weekly Insider, securityweekly.com forward slash insider for a 40% off Cyber Monday deal. That 40% off is good for any, any product in the store, which includes traditional hack naked sizes, uh, hack naked shirts, which we have in small through triple extra large now in both red and black ladies cut shirts with mud flap girl, mud flap guy, and the brand new smoke naked shirts also in small through triple extra large. They make perfect holiday gifts for your friends and family. Who doesn't want a hack naked shirt? Wear them on Christmas. The red is very festive. I'm going to wear mine on Christmas. Damn That's it. a beautiful thing. I, I bet you are. Paul Coggin, thank you very much for appearing on the show. Thank you all for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was a great time. Uh, job. Hey, and also, also, Paul, d- don't forget that um, that show 400 is just three short That's shows right. away. December, 19th, December the 19th. Job will be, uh, in the studio. be there, be square. We'll all be sitting at the same ugly looking red tables. Oh, wait, did I say that out loud? That's right. <laughs> Joff, thank you very much. Jack, thank you very much. Take us out. Over and out. <laughs>